morning. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Defining Your Health. I'm your host, Tracy Lewis, and this morning I have a very special guest with me. Very, very, very special. <laughs> All right. Uh, Miss Lara, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Um, well, I, that's a tall order you're giving me. I, I, don't, like to, I, you have I don't like to introduce myself, but I'm the president of Laura Tucker Longsworth. I'm the president of the Belize Cancer Society, and I've been doing that for many years, okay. among many other things. Yes, um, I think that you are um, a nurse as well. Yes, well, that's my substantive background. I have a master's degree in nursing with a focus on health systems management and uh, quality improvement initiatives. Um, and. Uh, I also sit on the um, the disciplinary committee for the Nurses and Midwives Council. I chair that committee, and um, I have a very strong focus on non-communicable diseases. And so I sit on the board for the Healthy Caribbean Coalition, which is out of uh, Barbados. And so, and of course, everything ties in with to what we do at the Belize Cancer Society. Right, so Ms. Laura is here this morning with us um, in the capacity of the president of the Belize Cancer Society. Yes. So what we want to talk about um, this morning, our topic is closing the cancer care yeah, gap. gap. All right, so Ms. Laura, just before we get into um, that discussion, why don't sure. you tell me a little bit about the Cancer Society? Um, sure. When was it developed and what was the, the need at that time for, for starting yeah. such an organization? It's, it's very interesting. Um, the founder of the Belize Cancer Society was uh, Juliet Soberanis, and uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, she was, Juliet was one of these dynamic Belizean women who was involved in cleanup campaigns, involved with the city council. She was a counselor and all of that. And she decided to take on the initiative to be the founder to, to really create an NGO called the Belize Cancer Society. Why? Because she had so much, I mean, it was difficult for her to get care. Right. It was hard for her to, to get her diagnosis. She had taken a biopsy, never got the result, oh. went back and got a second biopsy many months later, and, and by the time it was quite late. Yes. So too late. So. Um, she did whatever she could to make sure that other women could benefit from some services, especially support as much as possible um, to, in terms of their diagnosis and treatment when it comes to cancer. So then uh, that brings us to our mission and our vision, is her vision, and really what we do is support as much as we can, those affected by cancer, as well as their families. And we definitely, and we envision that we will have a comprehensive cancer response for the country that we can participate in. No, I'm not saying that the, the, the comprehensive cancer um, plan or program for the country has not been yet rolled out, but we continue to work along those lines we have done a lot of work over the years. I'm very proud to say that we have done a lot of networking and we've partnered with, partnered with many organizations, even with you today, having yes. us in. <laughs> we're, we're excited yes. Yes. Having for us, us. <laughs> to really talk about the work we do at the Cancer Society and, of course, the, the importance of understanding cancer, as cancer is one of those diseases that sits among um, a set of other diseases like diabetes and hypertension. It's called non-communicable diseases. Right. There well, are some diseases that are viral, some cancers that are viral, but by and large, it's referred to as an NCD. And I always like to ask the question about prevalence because sometimes when we hear about um, a disease or a condition and it's not immediately affecting us, we don't, we don't really see the big picture and we often yeah. hear about the hypertension and the diabetes, but is cancer really a big problem in Belize? You know, when uh, we began this long journey, because I, 
I was, uh, I became a part of the, the organization called the Belize Cancers. I mean, it was founded with some nurses taking part and helping Mrs. Soberanis to establish it. And so um, for all the work of all those women, a few presidents before me, have really, and lots of people work to, to really build the organization, build a, a, an office, a, 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 a secretariat to where we are now and we're still far from where we need to be. Wow. You know, but yes, we start when we started out, it was all anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And so when you there were times when you would speak to the medical community, they would oh, we don't have too too much cancer yeah. and so on. But then as as you got into it and as the years well you you know, people st stood up and said, Hold up, what's happening here? Yeah. So and, and today, everybody knows somebody that either has cancer, died from cancer, or otherwise. Yeah. Yes, it's the problem. Um, the, when you look at the, the world health statistics and data, like especially Pan American Health, they will tell you that if you have six people with non-communicable diseases, pressure, sugar, whatever, one of those is cancer. <laughs> And of course, in, uh, it's, it's alarming, really. We have new cases every year. Last year, in 2020, the Ministry of Health reported at least 300 new cases. 300 new, new cases, cases for the year. Yes, and 200 deaths, or a little bit over. And we know for sure that through our work at the Cancer Society with children with cancer, wow, that every, at least one or two every month there's a, a child that, yes, no, not a jet, but a new case. <laughs> a new, yes, no, 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 a new, a new child is diagnosed. So we, Mrs. Sobranes, and throughout the years we have worked and really lobbied for a really dynamic cancer registry. The Ministry of Health, uh, and it has to be a population-wide registry. The Ministry of Health has adjusted their database, their Belize Health Information System, to accommodate the data. So you're getting better information now. But the, the register is still not up to that point where you can do some analysis and say, okay, you have more cancers in one part of the country versus the other, one ethnic group versus another, and so on. How or a specific work? type of cancer or, because I was yes. like asked if it's primarily breast cancer or no well they they can do the the data base right now can tell you what those cancers are they can tell you for women is cancer of the cervix mm -hmm. breast cancer breast. um color colorectal cancers oh I, i'm not familiar yeah, with colon cancers colon and colon cancer. gastric okay. and colon cancers and for and lung cancer as well for men, it's prostate cancer. Prostate. For women, it's cervical cancer. For men, it's prostate cancer. And they have lung cancer, colorectal cancers, and so on. So they know. They have a, a, a set. Of course, you have other kinds of cancers to include the leukemias. Mm -hmm. And now for the children, the, the main one is leukemia that we see. And in we the have country. several cases in the least. Pardon me? And we have several cases. Of oh, course, our children, we, we, they're an, an children. And it's interesting where it, when it comes to children, children present with all sorts of strange cancers. But we don't have a pediatric special oncologist, okay. a can, like a cancer specialist, especially for children. Okay. So those children are directed to a pediatric oncologist in Merida, or if they can afford to go someplace else, they, you know, they take them to wherever. Now in Belize, we have oncologists, we have our cancer specialists at the Carl Huchner Memorial Hospital, and we have a non-resident oncologist at the Dangriga Cancer Center. And so now, so adults now have diagnostic capacities here in the country, the country has really developed. We have tests, you have diagnostic tests and so on. But I think where we're still lacking yeah. is the education. 
right. what we can do as individuals, what uh, to understand that cancer sometimes comes from nowhere, but especially if you're genetically inclined with a family history, a bad family history where you have lots of members with cancer. Right. Um, there are other, other matters, other lifestyle and what this is that right. really I, if we were to address mm -hmm. those things we would be able to herb yes reduce the incidence so i want to i want you to, to stick up in right there when you talk about the issue of education yes. what are some of the maybe campaigns or initiatives that the kansas society embarks yes. on we when we we have done a lot of education and what we have done is to really speak to the issue of non-communicable diseases and the, the risk factors because Just for our viewers um mrs Barron, mm. when you say non-communicable diseases you're sim you're simply referring to diabetes hypertension cancer some asthmas right and so um those that set of diseases they have like uh, some risk factors that is that you can modify and change to reverse the, those those conditions or at least to keep it under control and so then um we always have to remember our environment and you know we get a lot of conversations these days about environment but we must be sure that we're not our school buildings are not asbestos ceilings and so on um we've got to um Make sure that we, if you're in a area of a factory or so, that your air is not contaminated with with factors that can that are cancer causing. Um, you know, because it, the, the primarily the pervasive um, perspective is that cancer is caused by sugar. That if you don't eat sugar, you're not gonna have cancer. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. It's just that when you do have cancer. You, you, they, and you're in treatment. You're advised to have uh, given a certain diet so that the chemicals can take over, and and you reduce sugar and all the, all that. But sugar hmm. is part of that NCD. So if we take care of our health, because remember, people with diabetes have cancer. People with diabetes have all kinds of diseases and vice versa. So sometimes you have persons that are, have HIV infections and they also get cancer. So the education has to be there. But those factors that we're speaking about are reduction of tobacco reduction. smoke. Now tobacco smoke, people don't realize it. It's not only that it gives you lung cancer, but it could also give you oral cancers. It can give you cervical cancer and so on. <sighs> Plus, apart from that, it gives you chronic lung disease. So, you know, if people understand the dynamics of that alcohol, harmful use of alcohol, again, liver cancers and so on, you know? It just brings me back um, to the health message of our SDA community. And I have to promote it because we've been doing recently, you, hit, you, you mentioned all three of the recent episodes that we had. We, we, we spoke about tobacco, cigarette smoking, weed. We looked at um, diet, um, yes, and nutrition. Important. And yes. all of these things play together when we talk about um, the issue of cancer. And so um, the, the, it goes right back to, to the health message and being able to be temperate in, in, in all these things. So exactly. Or like we have to look at our lifestyle. And I mean, it's good for us, or it's good for our mental health even to have the spiritual aspect of, of wellness. But certainly for us to at some point understand mm -hmm. that you know, there are things, the way we are living, what we eat, what we put into our bodies that make us more prone. For instance, obese, um, obese persons are more susceptible, are, are not more, but they are susceptible to breast cancer, for instance. Um, but apart from that, a host of other illnesses. So the message is there. That's why I love to speak first to NCDs so mm -hmm. people can get that real sense of empowerment. There's so much we can do. We can get off the couch. We can get off the couch. We can exercise. 
very important to keep our, our body healthy. Um, then, of course, nutrition. We can learn to eat without all the fats and the gravies and all the sugars and, and everything else. And we, you know? we, we touched a little bit um, about lifestyle before we got to really the root of the problem. Cancer, yeah. when you hear about cancer, there's a fear. Yes. As soon as you go home and you tell your family that, you know, this is what the doctor said, um, there's, there's a certain fear because I want you to talk a little bit about what it, what it is about cancer that's scary. What happens? What are the consequences? You know? Yes. People, it's, first of all, a diagnosis of cancer is really something. I don't. I think that people don't realize the devastation when one person in the family is diagnosed with cancer, because unless you can address that cancer in a timely fashion, and unless it was diagnosed early, you already are at a disadvantage because your prognosis is poor. And of course, you know, the data clearly shows that you have more sickness and death from cancer in low resource countries because it's very expensive. So if you are, um, if your, con your country then and your public health system has to take that into account. And so there are certain kinds of screening screening tests that can be done and, and if and you have to have true access so the theme is closing the cancer care gap it is for us all as as a community as a government as a ministry of health to really look at how that can be done to ensure that the people who need a screening test or a diagnostic test can get it in a timely fashion and affordable, how, how? That's what I mean. What does that True like access it? means that money would not be a barrier. So a woman who needs a pap smear. Mm -hmm. And that should become a way of life. That's one of the, 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 the lifestyle changes that we should make. Our women must get their pap smear I think the cancer society has a lot to do with the mm -hmm. fact that we've had a lot of promotion. We have pap free smear. pap smear days. Exactly. We have... But then we need to improve on the we, other types of screening. But, but even through the COVID period, remember, all those clinics were just yeah. struggling to provide care for citizens. Um, and it was, it's no joke. We lost so many people during COVID. It's heartbreaking. And so you could truly, and, and that's because everything went towards that. But now that things are more under control, we have a good sense of what we can do. It is time for us to get back to our clinics, right. get back to our, to our nurses, and get ourselves tested. Women must have their cervical scan um, screening to make sure because, look, cancer of the cervix affects very young people and by mm -hmm. the time they're 26 they can we have had death wow whereas two things if you look at the broad spectrum prevention the ministry of health is now offering hpv vaccines to is children. now offering they off they they began that uh, just before covid two years before the covid period HPV and we're vaccine. HPV vaccine is good because HPV, human papilloma virus, mm -hmm. is the culprit of the, the culprit cervical, for cancer. Big cervical cancer. So if our, we, and I think it was the children in standard four, to standard course, six, yeah. and then now it's begun, they've begun, so it, it, it's now ongoing. So I think that we should build the demand, and make sure children get it because it gives them protection against cancer of the cervix and I think wonderful that it, is wonderful it's that wonderful but yes I, I don't know if we're readily um open before covid to the whole concept of vaccination exactly when it comes to our children yes. so I, i'm not sure how that effort looks like when it comes well, to we, education so actually the rollout was very good you know because it was an extensive rollout all over the country and it was, and it's a you know you have a permission and people it was well received it took a year the Ministry of Health did an amazing job. We helped them as much as we could. And I'm 
amazing job of rolling out that HPV vaccination. It's an international uh, discussion right now. It's, it's huge. Cervical cancer and the HPV vaccine. Yeah, because the countries have reduced their numbers of cervical cancer because of the, the, the success of that program. And not only that, but also the, the availability of all sorts of screening tests for cancer, for, for cervical cancer. You know? So we've got to get back into our clinics. We have to start we do. getting our checkup. We've got to, or we have to get our men involved, our men. We know our men have not, they're not the ones who like to go into clinics. They don't go for checkup. Some women too. Some women and some people generally will tell you, hmm, if I have cancer, I don't want to know. It's, yeah. It is an attitude. don't want it to affect me because I'll die sooner. It is what we believe. It's called health belief. And I think that over time we have to work on our families and friends to eliminate that mindset. You have to want to know, you know why? You have a family, you have your life ahead of you. Imagine if you can be detected really, really early. Imagine what a wonderful life you can have after. But I tell you what, late diagnosis is so expensive. Yeah. It takes away all the resources of the family and so on. So, and we can talk about treatment a little later on, but yeah. certainly in terms of understanding that cancer starts with education and making use of the public health system as well as the private sector for those who can afford it, but making use of the public health system to access preventative care. Right. And I wanted to ask a little bit about that collaboration mm -hmm. with, with the government because you mentioned that, um, you know, since the introduction of COVID, um, we need to go back to the clinics. But I remember and um, I had a brother who recently passed away um, from lung cancer and they didn't know that it was lung cancer at first. It was a misdiagnosis. Yes. And um, it's because he came in from the year before um, and he... he at the point where he was supposed to return, that's when, you know, we had this whole COVID situation and he couldn't get, he just couldn't get. So you understand because, very well that when I made right, that statement. Right. Um, because everything was about, you know, COVID and not yes. being able to facilitate any other um, appointments yes. that they're not. And, and so when you, you mentioned that, I'm wondering how the, the uh, Cancer Society assists. If I come in and I said, you know, I, I believe that. This is what I'm struggling with. Uh, mm -hmm. How can I get an affirmative diagnosis? I go to the office. What's the first? Can yes, you walk well, me through? What yes, we, what we do is that we call that patient navigation. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes to us, we will say, do you have a definitive diagnosis of cancer? Okay. So that person would have to say, well, we're having trouble with diagnosis or yes, here is my pathology form. What is available in the country? Mm -hmm. Right. So there are two things that happens there. Sometimes they, they, some patients come, they're just thinking that something is wrong. So we navigate them to the, to the, to the system, to a specialist or to where the services, where they can see a doctor and start the process of become, getting diagnosed. And so you then, assist with setting that arrangement? Yes, we, we, we direct them. We tell them what they have to do because it's highly confusing. Some of, some yeah. of our patients really, you know, they have problems, but they don't know where to go. Others are diagnosed and they're having trouble gaining access to treatment. And we also help them to navigate them towards that. Things have gotten really better when it comes to treatment because Carl Huchner Memorial now offers chemotherapy. And so you still have the, the cancer center. I, I'm out of it. Yes. I don't know how long they've been doing that. Just about a year, I think they opened oh, the, the, the facility. But the Dangriga, the cancer center in Dangriga has been there for from 20 something, 2013, I think. And they have, have treated thousands of um, patients with chemotherapy. And they now have a center in Belize City, right in the same building of the Belize Cancer Society. It's called the Belize Cancer Center Belize. City. And um, we continue with that work. We support them because they have a philosophy that we love very much. And that is really 
helping individuals who are really struggling with their finances to get to and who need chemotherapy to really right. get that service. And so we've been we that's 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 their philosophy and we 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 work together to do that, but it's expensive. And so we always have to say that we have to depend on the public to help us when we do our fundraising. And, and I know there was a setback with the, mm -hmm. with the yeah. huge setback with fundraising. Yeah, our booth cancer walk. We lost out on that completely. I'm hoping. Did that reduce your capabilities to assist the city? It certainly has. We are literally out of funds. And so mm -hmm. we've, had to, we've had to say that to everyone. But the cancer center in Dangriga, they, they still find a way because they have other sources of, of um, international support as well. And the, even that is, has been drastically reduced during the COVID because, you know, yeah. it's a global issue. And, um, but people are able to come in and uh, arrange for treatment. As well, right. chemotherapy, for sure, you can have that in Belize. No, um, we, in terms of diagnostic though, because we started talking about prevention, then we've gone to screening and diagnosis and early detection. And that comes with a set of things. And we do have those capacities in the country. You have biopsies that can be done. You have laboratories that can do certain tests of tissue to determine whether right. they're cancer cells or not. We have surgeons and I'm that sure can that do we've... big operations now. I'm so no? I want yes. you to share with me a little bit more of those good news yes. when we come back after the break. All I right. hope that you're, we're able to provide some information of how our viewers can donate. I know there was a huge setback yes. uh, to the Cancer Society. So when we come back, Ms. Lara is going to share with us some of those improvements, what we're doing to close the cancer care gap and what you can do um, to assist with that initiative. Thank you for joining us for Defining Your Health. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Pastor Emiliano Viamel. And I'm Elder Shane Neal. And, and we're, we're the hosts host of Hour of Power. Power. We are ready to pray for you and with you. Prayer is the key that unlocks heaven's door. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7, God cautions us not to be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Join us every Thursday night at 6 p.m. on our Facebook and YouTube pages as well as channel 98 on Central Cable TV to experience this peace that passes all understanding. You can join our Global Prayer family by praying that God continues to lead and bless this ministry by becoming a faithful viewer and inviting your friends and family to like and share our programs with your kind donations as well as your generous financial contributions. Contact us at 501-613-9351 or send us an email at atn at cbm.beliseunion.org. We are located at 10 and 3 quarter miles Northern Highway at the Tubal Trade and Vocational Institute. Thank you for being a part of the ATN ministry. And we pray God's richest blessings upon you and your family. Salut à vous tous. C'est très bien sûr que ça vous, que vous puissiez m'entendre à l'air et puis vous pouvez vous. Si lo que más te gusta es pasar tiempo con ta familia. Or whether you work in a skyscraper in a big city. L'ultime expérience. Y tú estás en el lugar correcto para entregarla. This year, the entire Inter-American Division will join together to make an international impact throughout our territory. Parce que peu importe ce que vous portez. What language you speak. ¿A dónde vivas? Hay alguien cerca de ti que necesita esperanza definitiva. Get ready to deliver the missionary book with final hope this April 10th. Inter America meets you.
です。<笑>はい。Brought to you by ATN in an effort to share the Advent message to our friends and faithful viewers who are yearning to build a growing and saving relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want to learn more about our rich Adventist heritage, basic fundamental beliefs, counsel and courtship and marriage, or simply a deeper study of God's written word, then join us Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. on our Facebook and YouTube pages. As well as Channel 98 on Central TV. Join in and be a part of this special Bible studies effort by praying that God continues to lead and bless this ministry by becoming a faithful viewer and inviting your friends and family to like and share our programs by your kind donations and, of course, your generous financial contributions. Contact us at 416 1 3 9 3 5 1 Or send us an email at atn at cbm.bleasunion.org. We are located at 10 and 3 quarter miles, Philip Golson Highway. Thank you for being a part of the ATN ministry. It is our prayer that you will keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to that which is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way. Prosperous and have good success. Hello, young people and youth leaders. I'm Pastor Gary Blanchard, and guess what? Global Youth Day is soon approaching, and all of us here at the youth department cannot wait. How about you? <laughs> the theme this year is loving the forgotten. Can you think of some people from your church that you haven't seen in a while? Is there a widow or an orphan in your community that is inevitably going through a difficult life transition right now? Or maybe some elderly or sick and shut in member needs your attention and care. Have you spoken to them recently or shown them God's love? Take this time to come up with a plan, a strategy. Connect with them. Send some care package letters for them to know that you, they are loved and never forgotten. In Matthew 25, Jesus reminds us that when we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, visit the sick, or those in prison, when we do for the least of these our brothers and sisters, we are doing it unto Him. <laughs> That's what GYD, young people and youth leaders, is all about remembering those we may have, unfortunately, forgotten. I love Global Youth Day because it's the springboard for living a life of service. Global Youth Day is not the end, but the beginning of an exciting journey. That's right. Once we have cared for the community physically, we have a chance to also care for them spiritually with a week of prayer. This is your chance to bring anyone who you ministered to during Global Youth Day or any other missing members to learn about Jesus and his life transforming love. This year's week of prayer is focused on the three angels' messages and how we can share the good news of Christ to all the world. Week of prayer always ends on the next Sabbath with homecoming Sabbath. This is the time to invite everyone we ministered to this past week. On this day, we want to invite our friends who haven't been around recently and celebrate with those who have been chosen. By Christ and have decided to be baptized. Yes! What a wonderful time this will be. I cannot wait. Remember to start making your plans now. Check our website, gcyouthministries.org, for all the Global Youth Day, Week of Prayer, and Homecoming Sabbath information. And make sure to use your hashtag GYD22 on all your social media posts. And on behalf of the General Conference Youth Department, we love all of you and we'll see you at Global Youth Day. Bye bye.
to defining your health this morning we have with us um zalara and she's sharing with us a little bit about her work that she does at the belize cancer society and i can see and i'm sure you can see as well that she's passionate <laughs> there's a quiet passion in her right um and I wanted to, to ask Ms. Lara, your, your motivation for being a part of this in, entire initiative, um, were you ever diagnosed? Have you had any direct... Well, I've never been diagnosed with cancer, but my father died from brain cancer. And uh, many, I have several of my friends. And then more recently, I have two family members, so th two family members with cancer. And a third one, uh, my older sister, Z. Agile, she oh. died died of leukemia. Right. So, you know, the passion is right there. It's like, wow. That's so close to home. It's very close to home, yes. And so, um, and so many friends I have supported, lots of friends. So, um, you know, as cancer diagnosis, we've, we've touched on it before, but we have to remember that it is devastating to families and friends. It interrupts your, your um, economic life. Definitely. It interrupts Definitely. your ability to, to produce, to be a productive citizen. And um, there are many ways when, when you look at cancer, they, they actually calculate it statistically how many um, economic days you lost in terms of productivity. Wow. You know, and so I think that we've, it's very important for us to understand the, the whole issue surrounding cancer, the economic impact, the psychological right. impact right. of when a family receives a cancer diagnosis. It's a terrible thing um, with mental health issues that, that arise I think from that's the that. first thing that we want to be able to empathize with the person with the mental issues, but we always have to go back, like you said, I, you, you're looking at cancer, cancer and the economic impact. But imagine that in a developing country where we naturally don't have the same... We don't have to... access. We don't have... We don't... All of us are not covered with insurance. A few of us are. We don't have health insurance. Um, and we don't think about it. Um, you know, our jobs are not... Don't allow us to even access care in the private sector. Um, when you have, when you need radiation therapy, you have to go abroad. Consider leaving your right. home for six weeks. That how will you eat? Where will you get money to eat? Your children pay for your hotel, money. and then wait. Now you still have to. Your kids have to eat, go to school. And it, it's tough. It's tough, and the family dynamics can be strange. Because within mm. families with these kinds of issues, there's tension, there's, it's stressful. And so some family members walk away, others, others are supportive. Um, and, but sometimes there are a lot of resentment because one person has to get the time of family. Sometimes mom or dad has to travel with the child or with the individual um whatever was there to buy penny shoe and and clothes and and food is no longer there the families need to understand that it's not easy it's not easy so it's very important for us to understand the dynamics of cancer and to take the initiative to look at preventative measures and early detection Exactly, and we, we mentioned some of those um, yes. earlier, and so right. I wanted to pick up right back where you mentioned uh, about treatment yes. and radiation and issues of getting access to those services and what exactly. that journey that journey looks like. You said that uh, in terms of the families and caregivers, yes. there's a lot of resentment, there's a lot of tension. But how can we alleviate that? And and what the, what does the education look like in that area for caregivers? Exactly, because caregivers really they take a licking, especially those moms with those children. Um, you know, we don't have a pediatric oncologist, as I said before. So when those children are diagnosed, the um, their, the pediatricians, um, we support the movement of those children to a center in Mer Merida where we fundraise and um, we have had in the past support from the Social Security Board, some funds to enable us to pay the for those, their treatment directly on based on a special rate that they give our children. Um, and there was that doctor, 
um, in Merida is known very well to the pediatric community here. Um, and he has actually conducted a study to present to his colleagues where it showed that since the children, especially the kids with leukemia, that they have been going, because they've been able to go to Merida in a timely fashion, that their survival rate has drastically improved, which is awesome. And you know, I, we should, since we're saying that, we should also mention that the survival rate is something that people always want to know about, you know? But the earlier you're diagnosed, the Better. The better your chances of survival are. But when it's late, it's just it's, it's just a matter of a month or, or three. Yeah. Maybe you get the most when it's yes. this late like that. Yes, and we and you know certain cancers are playing havoc on our productive sector. For instance, our men with with prostate cancer they're getting diagnosed earlier, and our women with cervical cancer they they're being affected in their twenties. And then our breast cancer rates are showing that our women in their 30s are dying from breast cancer. So the country has to be aware. And I think it's a, it's, it requires all of us, all of society, to really agitate. Whether you have an area representative, whoever it is you can reach to talk about these things and talk about the importance of having access to cancer care early in country because we can't afford to be spending so much of our dollars mm -hmm. outside of Belize. So we've got to work really, really hard. So is, is this where the, we're closing the cancer care gap starts with prevention and screening? Prevention, it comes with education. Education. Like we're doing today. Yes. Education, education. And I want to remind our yes. viewers that you can ask questions. Education. And and um, survivors in the Adventist community uh, who have yes. um, ongoing members who continue to battle it. They're doing well. Um, and so... Yeah. And, and I want to big, uh, do a big shout out to Dr. Sanchez. Yeah. Yes. 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 I want to give a big shout out to Dr. Sanchez. He's also been a, like a lifelong member and giving us support when we were hardly functioning. He was right there working with us, helping patients in ways that people would not imagine. Wow. Pay ways in that, I mean, we could call him. He would help some poor person who could not otherwise afford, he would do it. And that's just the way he is, because we can call on him anytime at ATN, and he's willing to share, to educate, and yes, he's a He loves well. to educate. He's, done, he's traveled all over this country for us. So big shout out to Dr. Sanchez, who is, I know he's a member of the this of group. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think that I should really remind our viewers that Radiation therapy is like, is part of the gold standard for cancer care. Right. Um, like chemotherapies, there's some cancers that do not require chemotherapy. Some cancers can have surgery, of course, uh, if there's surgery. <laughs> that, but chemotherapies, there's some cancers, chemotherapy will work. There are other cancers, the oncologist will say, no, 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 this patient needs radiation. We don't have a radiation bunker in Belize. And that is that is a very Huge difficult yes. And so we're looking, we're hoping that this year we can again pursue. Since the COVID period is is a little bit relaxed right mm -hmm. now, Some we look forward to to really talking to lobbying because we do a lot of lobbying okay. with with the officials to see. What can we do as a society to, to really take care of persons who need radiation abroad? I, I want to ask a provocative question, Ms. Laura. Sure. Like, why, uh, why is the government not assisting? Why is it this responsibility falls on an NGO as yourself? Well, I would not say it falls on us, but I think that we are we lobby. Um, it, and uh, I think that what where government has field, if, if you can call it a failure, is not having this massive comprehensive plan. But that being said, um, there are lots 
of services available in the public health clinics okay. and, uh, and uh, wherever the national health insurance is rolled out south side southern belize and now in the north they have increased their package of services okay. of screening services and i really am, i'm excited about that and encourage all our citizens in those areas to really to, to, have to really go find out and use the facilities that's being made available to them because quite often it's not it is the uptake is not what it should be and the services are there and so and it took a long fight for those to become available exactly so. so where we're concerned that's what we do we will okay. big up wherever the services are being offered and we all we always refer our citizens to the public health system because if you do that you it becomes accessible because you don't have to find 70 dollars a hundred and fifty dollars to get that done and if you need surgery you have to pay for it at Carl Huchner but it's not you you can enter up the main plan and you can pay off I wish more people would pay their bills at Carl Huchner too because we really need every bit of money we can find ourselves at the Cancer Society we advocate and lobby and where the gaps are we try to fill those gaps so for instance patient navigation we we intervene in getting the children to care we're still struggling with that um and i think that it's it's going to improve but in the meantime the on the citizens the nation has to know we do have issues we have a cancer care issue and we've got to, to support Right, and, I, and this is where I want to ask about your plans and in, initiatives for this year, in closing some yes. of what you identified to be exactly. priori priority gaps. Exactly. So this year, we're looking forward and we're hoping that the COVID situation improves, where we can continue our partnership with the Ministry of Health to really get cancer screening done across the country. Um, I think because that is only very center, important. As you said, in Down South and Belize City. Yeah, so but cancer screening is at all the clinics in the districts. Okay. But remember, those okay. those services were interrupted because of COVID. And so we look forward to really helping them in in the those rural communities who are really underserved to a great extent to get back on track with the cancer, cervical cancer screening. And um, and so what? That's what we do. We partner. We partner with the Ministry of Health. We partner with agencies, private companies to bring either education and service to their communities. How do you partner with us as an individual? How? Yes. What's my role to play as a partner? You with know, Society? I'm glad that you offered you asked that question. Remember that the Cancer Society is a group of volunteers. Mm -hmm. The only person that gets paid there would be the administrator and the office assistant. Apart from that, they, no, nobody gets paid. I, no, we are all, we, and we, lots of us who, to keep it running, have vol completely volunteer their services all these years. And I think that's important to know so that the community they can feel comfortable to donate. To the cancer society one to keep the doors open mm -hmm. and but more importantly to understand that lots of the money goes directly to making sure that people can pay for yeah, yes treatment. right now we would love to see a more structured approach to cancer okay. in the news we know that the government has started with their comprehensive plan it's been in years in the making. It's time for, for it to be launched and and funded. And so you are and funded. So <laughs> <laughs> because it's all about finance. You can't do anything without without money. And, and 
curious to ask about the research because there's a plan in the pipeline but mm -hmm. then for there to be a plan there needs to be a needs-based assessment and I, I don't know if we do have like you mentioned mm -hmm. a lot of research I know you have the registry but no. how have these plans been informed by the, actual the registry has is not yet functioning to that okay. level but what it does it has helped the Ministry of Health in planning and um, for instance, as I mentioned, the National Health Insurance, they have mm -hmm. put in additional pro, um, services to meet the needs based on the data that they're getting out of the cancer registry. So that's another thing. It, it, I think it, it, it will be very helpful in terms of educating the public if that data, that the database for cancer database that's mm -hmm. within the Belize Health Information System would be used to analyze the different cancers already we know age groups and so on but okay. it'd be good to know what what areas and and, right. and kind of target target their attention to a particular high-risk community versus other communities so i it's time it is time for us to move because you have to move up in terms <laughs> of improve on the on the, the um using evidence using the evidence right. that's that's the right point. using the evidence to really address this large problem and we are we consider ourselves at the cancer society as a serious partner because we no matter what we continue to educate and sp and really share the information with the public and, and that's where i'm thinking the, the the call for volunteers are because you yes. mentioned a group of other areas of expertise, yes. dietitians. Yeah, and you, yeah, and you know when even our we have a cancer support group even, right. and so that group is very important. We have just revitalized it since COVID. Mm -hmm. This year we we have a chair for that committee, and she is very passionate about about it. So. Um, if you wanted volunteer, please call, let us know. We can put you in a committee. But the big thing for us right now, we need finances. We really, really need some donations to help to keep our services going and to meet the cost. Although we're trying to, to um, write a proposal to, to really present to government about with the cost for care and for the children because they've done a wonderful job in the past in supporting us um and supporting the children not even the cancer society it yes. means that the children yes. are able now able there was a time many uh, about four years ago when children are always on the tv and, and and so on begging you hardly see that anymore because those that that child has us there's a seamless way seamless way of getting them to cancer care services and um where they don't have to initially worry about costs i'm so glad you said that because yes. you see initially on the news that uh, we need to have a barbecue to raise fund for this yeah. child and then yes. just disappears so i'm yes. glad to know that it disappears yes. some of those children we monitor that we monitor that i think and there are a couple of them that we have seen um, fundraising and we understand they needed to increase their own funds because traveling is expensive. Uh, what we do, we support the services that they get there. So when okay. they're fundraising, it's really for them to travel for treatment. But the, the Ministry of Health also gives them a stipend for travel independently. So their resources around and people there are quite a number of persons helping but it's hard for one person to know that so that's we navigate patients we know where it's where those resources are and we help patients to work their way through the system because it's very frustrating yes yeah, it's very frustrating for them and i want to encourage people not to not to be don't don't sit at home with a cancer diagnosis call somebody if you're having if you're afraid of the hospital because of covid call us at the cancer society you know right through the covid period people we were able to get people through the border with the support of the ministry of health and immigration foreign affairs to merida 
and back home. So people got their treatment. With the children, there's um, the cancer center in Dangriga and through Dr. Grant and um, the sister Delone Pascasio, they are the CEO and managed founders of the, that treatment center. They arranged with some key medical officials here and those children are able to get their spinal infusion of chemotherapy right here in Belize. So innovation, innovation during the COVID period, but now that's, that can continue. So it cuts down on that travel for those five or six children. Because we're able to have these conversations. Yes. So I love that last call you yes. made to uh, an appeal that we cannot help if we don't know. Yes. Um, and I just want to remind our viewers that we have Sister Michelle Gamboa, we have Sister Delcia Dawson, we've seen these faces, we've heard their testimonies. So um, you can support financially by making a donation. It doesn't matter at which point of the journey that That's finance right. is definitely going to um, for care, and you can also donate directly to the Belize Cancer Society. Yes. We have the number on the screen. Yes. How you could assist with that because as soon as it knocks at the door, it becomes a reality where you it would is. have wanted that assistance. Certainly, right? certainly, yes. So, Miss Laura, as we're winding down, yes. um, I just want to say that I'm so happy to have you uh, here with us on set at ATN, and you made me realize that we have a responsibility as well as a media broadcasting yes. center. To, to spread uh, more awareness and to um, bring up the cases that is present, not to let up, to lobby, to ensure that it's not something that we easily forget because it's a pervasive, it's a present present issue. And um, mm -hmm. in our health messages, health evangelism, we want to stress that prevention lifestyle that you mentioned. And please, please remember the spiritual part of that journey. Amen. Is very important because at the end of the day when the burden gets heavy there's only one great physician that's it and so we've got to i think if if your group of of spiritual leaders definitely remember that to remind people regardless of what they're going through their spiritual well-being is very important and even through the um, educating of persons with cancer, reminding them that sometimes they need to write things down. They need to say what they want done for themselves in the event that they can't do it. And so that the families are not so confused and frightened when, if, if it is that they end up with terminal cancer and so on. So you need a living will to say what you want done and you need to get your house in order as well. Right. Now, people are suspicious of that kind of conversation because it feels like, oh, you're just, you are put them in. Yeah. No, 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 no. We have, if we, we have to learn to love one another, care for one another lovingly, <laughs> right? Care for one another lovingly. So. Well, thank you so much, Miss Lara. Um, we'll be glad to have you back for uh, another segment and yes. I hope our viewers um, feel comfortable in sharing their questions and if you need assistance, you can send a message. Yes. We can forward that to the Cancer Society. Yes, please. Um, and we want you to, like Miss Lara said, you don't have to be afraid or ashamed and definitely do not have to sit alone at home, uh, depressed, um, exactly. anxious, worried. And get them counseling, yes. Have support, right? Yes. So we want to thank um, the Blaze Cancer Society for the great job that they've been doing in our community. You. Do you have any last final words? No, I just think that I just want to ask everybody. This is, I, we are not done at this COVID period, but please, it's time to take care of your health. Visit your health clinic and get a checkup. And please learn more about how you can prevent cancer. And if you're diagnosed, where you have to go. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Defining Your Health. We really hope that you enjoyed it. I will see you again next week for another topic.